also to be reminded as to who we are. And so we're going to look at that a little bit this morning and then walk into this passage again and, and see the instructions that, that Paul has given us. But one of the things that I've wrestled with is the issue of that there is public discipline and what does that look like and why does he immediately go to that. But we'll get to that in a little bit. But I, just walking through this passage, it's interesting. I start reflecting on the life of the church in history. And there are some things I think that we let go of that are so important in the church. And I know that they're tradition. And I realize that we have a tendency to exalt tradition up above the Word of God and so on. And tradition, oftentimes, we tend to sort of, we're creatures of habit. We do things and we might do it for a good reason up front, but after a while we forget why we do it, the principle behind it. We just do it because we do it and we've always done it kind of thing. So I realize the danger in traditions and so on. One of the early traditions was Anglican tradition. I, I really like it, but I'm not going not gonna to go there. And don't worry, we're not going to become Anglican. But I, I like one of the traditions is that when they would read Scripture, when they would finish, they would say, this is the word of the Lord. And the people would respond, blessed be the Lord. I think that's a great tradition. And I think that that's honorable to the word of God. The other thing is that in the early church, there was catechetical teaching. There was instruction that, that people were schooled in the doctrines. And so Westminster Confession was that. There would a question would be asked, and then the people would re respond with the answer, the doctrinal answer or the ethical answer, depending on whatever aspect they were looking at. And then they developed that for the kids. So parents would teach their kids, and they would go through the Westminster Short or Westminster Confession. They would ask a question, and the kids would respond to the doctrine. And there's some goodness in that, and I think that that is a good thing. But again, it's something that sort of becomes rote. We do that. All the stuff we get in our head, we can answer the questions, but does it actually make it down to our heart? And so we sort of have done away with that. But the problem is we have that problem anyway when it comes to the Word of God. But one of the traditions and one of the aspects of Westminster Confession is this, and it's very pertinent to this passage this morning. It says this, the church censures are necessary for the reclaiming and gaining of offending brethren, for deterring others from the like offenses, for purging out that, uh, that leaven which might infect the whole lump, for vindicating the honor of Christ and the holy profession of the gospel, and for preventing the wrath of God. Something I think that we forget is that God still punishes sin. I mean, you look at 1 Corinthians 11, when he talks about some are weak, some are sick, and some are asleep, that's a euphemism for dead. Right? Because as believers, we know we're going to rise again, so we use that euphemism for death. In other words, there were some who sinned, and God judged them, and they're dead. We think that the story of Ananias and Sapphira is far gone. It's not far gone. Right? God can still exercise His wrath on us if we don't do something about our sin in the church. So the confession goes on to say, which might justly fall upon the church if they should suffer his covenant and his seals thereof to be profaned by notorious and obstinate offenders. This is taken right out of the text. This is a great confession. We should all confess this. This should be something that we all know and understand and hold to be true, that we are going to deal with sin in the church of God. But I think part of our problem is we don't realize who we are. So I take you back to chapter 1, verse 2, when Paul says it's God's church. The problem is that oftentimes the church becomes sort of like a social club. And then we get to the point where we think, well, it's our social club. And we invite people around that we want around us and the people that are into the things that we're into. And let's gather around us the people that have like interests and common stuff and all of that. And, and it just becomes a social club. Well, then it's a, it's a point in which we're just there to hang out with friends and no worry about sin and purity and holiness and all of that, right? We have to keep reminding ourselves it's God's church, and therefore it is to function according to a standard. And not only that, but we are His called-out community. Now, the term ekklesia, church, is from two words in Greek, ek, which is out from, and kaleo, which is to call. So essentially, Paul is saying we are a called-out community. We have been called out from the world unto a relationship with God. Now, I will tell you that not every time does this term ekklesia bear this etymological significance. I'll tell you two places that it does. First Corinthians is one because Paul all the way through here is talking about the gathered, assembled, called out community and he's also focuses on purity. Another place that's interesting is in Acts. In Acts chapter 5, we find the first time in Acts the word church is used, ecclesia, in reference to the community of God's holy people and it's after the incident of Ananias and Sapphira. 
It's very defining then in that passage. It is a community of the Spirit and it is a community in which there should be holiness and purity. We are a consecrated community in Christ. Paul says in chapter 1, verse 2, that we have been sanctified in Christ. This is a great truth. Hagiazo, it means to cleanse, purify, sanctify, is derived from hagias, and it means to cleanse from sin, expiating a guilt by means of an atonement. And it is to render sacred by consecrating a person or a thing unto God. This is a truth that is so real for us. We understand our position. Sometimes with believers, we just don't know where we are with God. It's like we, we accepted the gospel and someone didn't take us further and tell us what exactly happened to us, right? We accepted the truth, we, we confessed Christ, we accepted into our heart, but no one told us really who we are then in Christ. What is the significance of the salvation that we have? The amazing thing is that we have been set apart, we have been sanctified, we are made holy in Christ. That's an amazing truth. The first time I realized going through Philippians when he called saints, he was talking about me. I could not believe that. Right? In the Catholic Church, you got to do three miracles in order to be affirmed as a saint, right? Now, I'm a saint in Christ by nothing I did or anything that I offered, just purely by the work of God. That's awesome. But that's who I am now. That's my standing before God. We have been rendered sacred, not only unto salvation, but unto service. So if you think of the Old Testament, the Levites, the priests, they were consecrated and rendered sacred to God's service and worship. All the utensils in the temple, right, they were all sacred. They weren't used for common use. You didn't take them home and eat Thanksgiving dinner off them and then bring them back to the tabernacle or the temple. No, they were sacred. They were used only for God. That is you and I. We are sacred. We have been set apart for the work and worship of God. We are not to the, then indulge in the profane things of this world. The amazing thing about this statement, it's a perfect passive participle. You say, well, so what? This is an amazing truth. Perfect tense indicates that it is a continuing state of existence. We stand in the state of being sanctified and made holy in Christ. Passive voice, God did it. We had nothing to do with it. This is what God has done in our life. He's made us holy. He's consecrated us. He has said that you are my special holy people. You are a holy priesthood. Just, just let that, I, to me, I, I'm just going to tell you, I have been wrestling this week. I want the burden of the holiness of God to rest upon my life. I want to feel the weight of that. I want to feel the weight of that. Because I think in the church today, we've lost the weight of that. We've lost the weight of the significance. We are sanctified in Christ. That we have been made holy. Not only that, but he takes it further. That we are called saints. Chapter 1, verse 2. And then he says on top of that, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. Now this is awesome because he says here in the Greek, naos, you're the naos of God. Now there are two words for the temple in those days. You had the heeron, which was used of the whole entire precinct. Storage areas, all of that. All of the courts of women, courts of the Gentiles, everything was the heeron. The naos was the holy of holies. Just, just dwell on this now. With the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, because we have received Him, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. Not just as we gather together. You, you, just think, you are a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's not just when we gather together in our midst, He is here and we are the temple. No, you are a temple. <laughs> just let the burden of that, the weight of that fall upon you. Now think about the significance of this. So when Moses is out there in the desert, right, tending sheep, and the, and the Lord appears to him in a bush, and, and that was the place of God's presence, right? And God appears to him in a bush, and he says, I want you to go bring my people out of the land of Egypt, and you're going to bring them to this mountain here, okay? And then he's going to bring them out there, and he says, this will be a sign to you. You will bring them here. So, so Moses goes and brings the people. They come to Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 19. They don't move until Numbers chapter 10. That whole time stayed at Mount Sinai. God comes down. He's on the mount. He says, the people can't even come near this mountain. If they touch it, they'll die. So people says, Moses, you go up and talk to God because we can't go near this. We'll die. That's the presence of a holy God. He is on this mountain. He says, okay, I want you to construct a tabernacle. And in that tabernacle, I'm going to reside. My presence will be there. The end of Exodus, the climax, the tabernacle is built and God's Shekinah glory comes down and rests in that tabernacle. And that is the place of his dwelling. And then finally he gives Solomon permission to build this temple and that is going to be the place of his dwelling. 
But then they sin. And Jerusalem is destroyed. The temple is destroyed. And Ezekiel dwells on this in chapter 10. And he reflects on the fact that the glory of the Lord has departed. Now all of a sudden we come to New Testament times. The veil has been torn in two. There is no more temple. It's destroyed. Who is that temple and the dwelling place of God? You and I are. Just think about that. I am the naos of God and His Spirit dwells in me. The weight of that then should lead us then when we look at these issues and dealing with moral issues, especially in chapter 5 and the problem of the sin and incest and immorality, we should then do something about it because this is who we are. And this is the great thing about realizing who you are. Then you know what to do, right? I mean, when you go get hired onto a job, when you're given a job, they tell you your position, right? They don't let you go, okay, wander the halls and figure out a place that works for you. No, they give you a position. They tell you this is your title, this is your place, and then you know what your role is. God doesn't leave us wandering around saying, okay, you're saved now, go figure out who you are. No, he says, I'll tell you who you are. And then when you know who you are, then this is how you're supposed to behave, right? If we are the holy people of God, then there is something that we are supposed to do when it comes to the issue of sin. And so Paul addresses in chapter 5, there is the issue of immorality in the midst. And Paul says we need to deal with this problem. And so he addresses it in chapter 5, verses 3 through 8. And he says there is a need for discipline. Now, I know I hesitated to use this term discipline. When we talk about church discipline, and, and the, the struggle that I have with that is it, it sounds sort of like this, this official thing where we gather the leaders together and there's a vote and all this stuff, and, and, and we kind of do that in church, right? If you're, you're raised in a high church or whatever, and you sort of have, you have worship service, and afterwards we got business to take care of, right? It's what it sort of sounds like when you talk church, church discipline. The reason why I hesitate is because it should be something that naturally flows out of us, but there is no doubt that discipline is happening here. There needs to be discipline in the church. And it can be a beautiful thing if we handle it in the right way. But the whole thought is summed up in the fact that you need to remove this one from your midst who did this very thing. He needs to be ek mesu. He needs to be taken out of the community. And this is where we get our idea of excommunication from. It is the putting of someone out from the communion of the church. So Mormons, they have you know, used to back in the day. And others, you have the shunning, right? If someone has violated the community life, they are then shunned, right? Ostracized. Don't know that we take it to that degree, but that is the idea is that they are placed outside of the security and the privilege of the community and handed over into the hands of Satan. And there's only two places in all of Scripture that we find this, 1 Timothy and here. And so I'll just tell you, we have to be cautious. You know, I'm, it's interesting. My lifetime, I've only seen a few times where someone's had been excommunicated from the church. Few. My whole life I've spent in the church. Seen all kinds of stuff. Only a few times I've seen someone excommunicated from the church. I've seen people restored too, which is a beautiful thing when that happens. If you're in a body and you got a body from here and you're in a body and you've got several people in a year's time who've been excommunicated, you might start asking yourself, is there something wrong here? Right? I think in 13 years of grace, there was only a couple people that were excommunicated, right? One time in Master's College, I could only remember when we had to deal with something publicly with a professor. It's not something that we rush to, but it is something that we must be willing to do. There must be discipline. There needs to be a clear-cut challenge, and then there needs to be change. And the reason for this discipline is it necessary for the good of the individual, and it's necessary for the good of the community. So in verses 5 through 6, he's going to do the community's purity, but then in 3 through 5, he's going to deal with the emphasis that's going to fall on the fate of the man. And the discipline necessary for him is seen in this, and it's summed up in this statement, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. This always has to be kept in mind for us. This is the end game. This is the goal. This is the focus. In other words, when we have to practice this and we have to remove someone from our midst and excommunicate them from the life of the body and from the security of the community. We're not seeking their damnation. We want to see them restored. We want to reclaim them for the Lord's glory, yes? And so therefore we need to understand that this isn't supposed to be something that's permanent. It's not just merely punitive, it's remedial. That they might repent and return to the Lord. That's the ultimate desire. It should always be so. And so therefore, if we practice church discipline, we remove some from the body, and this isn't the ultimate focus and desire and the outcome of it, then we're not doing it accurately. It's like I tell parents, we're supposed to discipline our children. Proverbs tells us this. It tells us exactly how to do it, right? But if we don't do it how God does it, then it's not done accurately, right? Then we shouldn't do it at all. 
So the act of discipline, the absence, Paul's going to respond to the situation in chapter 5, verse 3. He says, for me on my part, although absent in body and present in spirit, have already judged him. This is perfect tense. He stands in the state of being judged, who has committed this, as though I were present. So then he's going to call them to action. He's going to call out the community to respond with him. And therefore, Paul is saying, I've taken decisive action regards this individual, but I can't do this alone, and I don't want to do it alone. Now, this is important to me because this is a section where I started to sit and dwell because he wants the whole entire community involved in this process. Because the, the, the effect is happening upon the body of Christ. His behavior is affecting the rest of the church, right? It's what sin does. It permeates. It's why he uses the term leaven. It just starts to permeate, and it will corrode, and it will start to influence the lives of others. And if this sin isn't dealt with, others might start to commit this sin, or other sins like it. They might look and say, you know what? No one's doing anything about this. They really don't care. It doesn't matter. I can do what I wish. So in 5.12, we have this plural form whom Mace used when he talks about the fact that you are the ones who judge the insiders. And then 5.13, he commands them that you are to expel the evil one from your fellowship. Clearly, he wants them involved in the process. You must do this. He wants them to join with him. And he wants them to join with him in the action. And the idea is this, because Paul is trying to develop the spiritual community. He's trying to mature them. But he doesn't want them to be this, sort of mature, this community in the sense that if they give a fitness report, it says works well under constant supervision. They need to be autonomous. They need to be able to handle this on their own. They don't need to have Paul as an apostle speaking with authority saying, you need to do this. They should have done this already. He wants them to be responsible to exercise in the regards to the Lordship of Christ and the guidance of the Holy Spirit, he wants them to deal with the sin in the church of the body. And he doesn't want to have to be official about it. So there's a threefold context in which he wants them to deal with this disciplinary process. Notice with me the first one in verse 4, in the name of the Lord Jesus. The second one is in the spiritual assembly as they gather together. And the final one is with the power of the Lord Jesus. Now notice that the, the verse is bracketed, verse 4, in the name of the Lord Jesus and it ends with the power of the Lord Jesus. All the way through chapters 5 and 6, there are, are crucial moments through these chapters where he refers to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. He's going to come back to in the name of the Lord, chapter 6, verse 11. He says, such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Over and over he's going to refer to the Lordship of Christ. So this action of the assembly, verse 4, he says that when you assemble together and I with you in spirit, verse 5, this is what I want you to deliver such a one over to Satan for destruction of the flesh. He wants all of this bracket in the Lordship of Jesus Christ. The three truths then that this spells out for us, the fact is that we need to do it under the total authority of Jesus Christ as Lord. The only authority we have to act is in His name. That's it. And we need to ask ourselves then, then when we do say, well, if I, I do this in the name of the Lord Jesus, am I truly doing it to His honor and glory and in His name, or am I doing it in my name? Right? I, I've seen the churches of pastors and elders that because they want to control and manipulate the way that the body goes, they've excommunicated people from the body because they don't agree with them or don't do things their way. They use that as a means of making things happen the way they want them to happen. Therefore, they're not doing it in the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they're not doing it for His glory. The second thing that I think is interesting about this is that was, was to be corporate. Paul with them present. Why does he go public with this? And this is interesting to me, because if you go to Matthew 18, starting in verse 15 and following, right? Matthew 18, Jesus' instruction is you go to one, if he has sinned, of a brother sin, sinned, you go to him privately. And if he repents, then you have won your brother. Amen, right? And he's restored. And you don't go any further with it than that. However, if he doesn't repent, then you go with two or three. And then if he doesn't repent, then you take it before the entire church. So Jesus is given a progression of this is what you do until there is a solution. Why does he go public then? There's no reference to private confrontation of this man and to lead him back to Christ. Why does he go public with it? Okay. And I'll and I suggest this to you is because it's already public. Chapter 5, verse 1, he says, actually, it is reported that there is immorality of you, among you which is of such a kind. This is present tense. It is continuously spreading this report. It's already out there. People know about it, not just in the community, in, in the Christian community, but outside the community. And then it finally spread to Paul. In other words, it's already a public issue. 
I realized this when I was teaching through Matthew and we're talking about the brothers in seminary and we're walking through that. And so they said, well, how about in Galatians chapter 2? Why does Paul confront Peter and Barnabas publicly? Why, do they, why does he do that when you're supposed to go privately and confront them and then so on? And I said, because they made it a, a public issue. Their offense was public and they were bringing other people into their sin, right? And so Paul confronted them publicly. If you, so here's the principle then. If you can, if you know a brother or sister is in sin, you go to them privately and confront them privately. If it is not a public issue, if you can restore, restore them privately, then it must remain private. And there's such wisdom in that because when you think about it, if someone hears about a sin that so-and-so committed, they tend to be stigmatized with that. And although we're supposed to forgive and, and release them and, and not think about it and not hold it over them, we have a tendency to put people in these categories and stigmatize them with the sins that they commit. Well, there's a tendency that if everyone hears about so-and-so did this, even though they've already repented and they've been restored and they're walking in the Lord, we sort of look, oh, there goes the adulterer, there goes the so-and-so, right? It's preservative. I think that's a great thing. There have been times I've had to confront people on serious issues. They repented. They were restored. You just don't tell anybody. But we have a tendency, though. When we hear about someone's sin, we go tell everybody about it. Or we don't deal with it privately. Give me an example. So there was an issue. A youth pastor, he is a young man in the youth group, calls me and says, I need to talk to you about something serious in the youth group. And so the pastor says, okay, well, why don't we get, we'll, we'll get together and talk over a soda. So they get together and talk, and this young man says, you know, I, I came to you because my mom asked me to come tell you about this. And the youth pastor says, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, there, my mom was talking with a friend of hers, both of them believers, both a part of the same body, and, and my mom was talking to a friend, and she was sharing how her daughter was involved in these things, and, and that the mom was actually giving approval to it. And he says, so my mom came and told me to come tell you to do something about it. The youth, youth pastor says, well, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So your mom is a believer, right? And she's a part of this body, and so is this woman. And this woman tells your mom that this is going on. Your mom didn't confront her, call her out on the sin, right? Call for restoration, repentance, any of that? No. Her first thing was to tell you, and then you go tell me, so that way I'll go deal with it. But see, that's what we do. We just tell everybody else, right? We get on the phone, hey, can you believe what so-and-so did, right? And then they wind up being stigmatized by that. And they never get out from under it. So if we can, do it privately. If we cannot, two or three. And if we cannot, then we take it before the body. But if it's made public like this, then it has to be a corporate thing. And we need to deal with it publicly. It has to be done. Because then the rest of the community, the outside world, looks in and says, see, they allow this to go on and do nothing about it. The final statement is the power of the Lord Jesus. That's the final part in verse 4. And I love this. Their ability to act in the very worst that Satan can do is totally under the authority of the Lord. Because their action is determined by the power of the Lord. They have the power then to act in Christ, but it's also understanding that He has the power over Satan. Satan will bring destruction, but only insofar as the Lord allows it to happen. Then we realize that Satan becomes a tool in the hand of God. Have we not seen this in Scripture? Job, right? Job. Righteous man needs to be refined, sanctified and purified for greater work. Paul, thorn in the flesh, right? Attributed to Satan. God allowed it to be, to refine and to purify. If we cannot say that we're doing it under the total authority of the Lord, in the name of the Lord, and we're not doing it with His power, then we should not and ought not to do it. And it is the only way that we can act. The action of the assembly then is delivering this offender over to Satan. Notice me, verse 5. And I have decided to deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. That is the happy end. But this term here, used in reference to delivering to Satan, paradidomi. This is a strong term. It indicates the judicial act of sentencing. This is discipline. This is discipline. You realize that this particular term is used by Paul in Romans chapter 1 three times when he talks about the fact in Romans 1.18 that the wrath of God is presently continuously being poured out upon man. And three times he says man was handed over, handed over, handed over. That was an act of judgment by God. Do you realize that our sinfulness is an act of judgment of God upon us? Fine. Do you want to do it? All right. Here you go. You turn your back on me? You want to live your own way? You want to live an autonomous life? All right, I'll give you what you want. It's more than that. So 
So when we deal with this brother or sister who has committed this kind of sin, we are, if you will, producing a judicial act when we deliver them out of the body. And it's interesting because he refers to him as such a one. He doesn't mention by name. When he does this in 1 Timothy, he mentions them by name. Hymenaeus and Alexander. It's very unusual for Paul to call out and give names, which means they must have done something real serious. And then later we find from Hymenaeus in 2 Timothy chapter 2 that they were saying that the resurrection has already come and Paul calls their teaching gangrene, right? It's rotness and infesting the body. They said that the resurrection has come. That's a cardinal truth of Christianity. So therefore, Paul calls them out by name, right? He doesn't do that here. And the other thing that he does by this is not only does he expose the, the abhorrent character of the individual, but he also broadens this, that this principle is applicable to everybody. Anyone who commits this kind of sin, you need to deal with them in the same kind of way. So he is to be excommunicated from the church and become like the heathen, exposed to malignity of Satan himself. I think that it's hard for us to really grasp the significance of this act. This was a serious issue. You realize that in the community of God's holy people, there is a sense of protection and there is a sense of privilege. But when we are moved from that, that security is taken away. That privilege is taken away. In other words, if I can put it like this, it's like being dropped defenseless and disowned behind enemy lines, right? In occupied territory, and you're left there all alone. That is essentially what is happening. There, God, Paul is saying, you need to hand them over into the realm of Satan and let him do his worst on them. And he will be a tool in the hands of God to bring them back to where they need to be, to ultimately bring about their salvation, the consummation of it. But we're not to infer from this by any means whatsoever that this is purely talking about damnation. We are to see them as brothers, as brothers, and we want to see them restored. And we realize that salvation is a process. There is that day when I was seven years old, I was saved, but I am also in the state of being saved. Chapter 1, verse 18 of the same verse. For those who are being saved, continuously being saved, in the process of being saved, right, is the power of God. And then finally one day that salvation will be consummated and I will be saved in the end. This is what he's looking forward to. We are assuming that he is saved. We don't know it's up to God because he's the Savior. He is so terror, I am not. So we're not to judge and say, well, I don't think you're saved and I don't, I, that's not up to us. Assume he is, I will take him as a brother, so-called brother, but in the end we are hoping that in the end he will finally be delivered, ultimately. To be handed over to Satan then, to any kind of physical punishment, whether terminal or temporary, for him to do his very worst is under the control of God. I mean, you just think about this. The sovereign purposes of God include the destructive potency of Satan. That's a huge thought. Job, Paul, right? Peter, Satan has asked permission to sift you. And he was sifted, wasn't he? Denied Christ three times, but then restored. Restored. And then read his letters and the strength that he imposes upon the body of Christ and provides, but that is because he had been sifted. The ultimate focus then and purpose is the deliverance of this individual in the end. The discipline is necessary for the good of the Christian community, verses 6 through 8. Paul focuses on the necessary wholeness of the individual Christian. Now he's going to focus on the necessary wholeness of the body. Notice with me in verses 6 and following, For boasting is not good. Do you not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump of dough? Clean out the old leaven so that you may be new lump, just as you were in fact unleavened. For Christ our Passover has also been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. The feast of the Passover provides the unfolding critical importance of this discipline that needs to take place in the Christian community. The very nature of the Christian community is based on this new Passover. This lamb sacrifice that has been given. There should be absolute purity because of this. Therefore, if we have someone who is persistent and flagrant in their sin and they remain in the community and we accept them without discipline and so on, then we taint the whole body of Christ and we offend the honor of Christ. And sometimes I don't think we think about that. 
It's what happens when the church gets focused on, on this level here rather than this level here. We seem to sort of focus on the horizontal instead of the vertical. The command comes in verse 7, then you need to purge out. Strong terminology. Clean out is a little bit easier going. It's a little bit simplistic. Purge out, the first aorist, effective, active, imperative. This is imperative. You must do this. It's an old verb. It means to cleanse out, to clean completely. It's the same with leaven, right? If you don't take it all out, what does it do? It permeates, even the slightest little bit. Yes? I mean, I'm not a, I'm not a baker, so I don't know for sure, but I'm assuming that that's the truth. The slightest little bit it permeates the entire lump. It needs to be completely removed. The heir's tent shows the urgency of it. It needs to be done now and it needs to be done effectively before the whole church is contaminated. And this goes back to the Old Testament, the instruction that was given, the command to purge. That was palion, that which is old and decaying, that old decaying leaven. It needs to be removed before the Passover feast. It's similar to our present ideas and methods of disinfection after the contagious disease. It's how we need to see sin. Every time I get sick, I think about sin, right? It's like you're down, it's just fested your whole body, you just don't feel right, and everything's just, ugh, right? That's sin, and we have to remember that. And it has an influence upon the rest of us if we don't deal with it. The purpose of the command, verse 7, is this, that you may be on, not on, clean out the old leaven so that you may be a new lump. There's two different words that can be used, kainos, and then this is not on, and that on is used in reference to that which is fresh. In other words, give yourself a fresh start as a community. Remove the contamination. Start over again, right? The pure result of this command, verse 8, we'll come back and look more of this next week. I have to come back and look at these last two words, sincerity and truth. But he says, Therefore, let us celebrate the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and of truth. This must be, it must be, if we are the holy community of God, if we have been sanctified in Christ, if we have been set apart for the work and worship of God, if there is sin, it must be dealt with, but it must be dealt with God's way right? As he instructs us. A few thoughts when we think about the issue of sin. We need to be willing to restore our brother and sister in Christ. Man, we see there's sin in their life. Deal with it. Deal with it. Don't walk away from it. And don't pass it on to someone else. And definitely don't make it a public thing if it doesn't have to be a public thing. But always be willing to restore such a one, to see them in a right relationship with God. If we love them, we will. Right? I mean, it's the same thing with our children. If we see them walking down a path they shouldn't be going down, we, we love them, we interfere, we step in, we get involved, right? We get in their face if we have to. You can't keep going this way, right? And if we have to, in the case of my father, then you remove them out of the midst of the rest of the family so they don't contaminate. But you must act and must act decisively. But it's about restoration. It's about reconciliation. There's a need to keep that sin from spreading to others, and so therefore, if they're unrepentant and they continue in it, then we need to deal with it publicly. We have to. And we need to protect the purity of the church, but more importantly, we need to protect the honor of Christ. Because here's the truth of it. If we don't do something about it, He will. He will. May God help us as we seek to live in light of the fact that we are sanctified in Christ Jesus. We are the naos of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for the truth of who we are because of what you have done in your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. That, Father, we are holy, that we've been set apart, that we are not common anymore. That we've been set apart for special use by you, for your worship and for your work. Father, that we are each a temple in which your spirit resides. He makes his dwelling in us completely and fully in the entirety of his being, Father. And it just is such a glorious truth, such an awesome truth. I feel, Father, that we would be burdened with the weight of that. That we would feel the sense of the heaviness of your glory and your holiness. That, Father, somehow that would impact the way that we live our life. 
that we would not cheapen your love, that we would not cheapen your grace, that we would not cheapen your mercy. But Father, that we would walk in light of the fact that you are holy. And it's your holiness that gives your love such great significance and your grace and your mercy and the deliverance and the freedom that we have. Father, thank you for your forgiveness. And I thank you for the fact that if we confess our sins, then we can appropriate the work of Christ on the cross to our lives. And Father, you will forgive us. I thank you for that truth. Again, I pray for your blessing upon all those who are here and upon your church throughout this world, Father, this day. We pray these things in your name. Amen.